Coming up on Network Africa. Burkina Faso Jonta dismisses the country's army and spy chiefs restoring the constitution. France reviews its military presence in Mali after expulsion of Ambassador Bast. South Africa braces for second storm back Sirai barely a week after tropical storm Anna. Welcome to the program, I'm Layo Adegoke. The military junta that took power in Burkina Faso has dismissed the army and intelligence chiefs in the country. The former army chief, Brigadier General Gilbert Wadraogo, has been replaced by the head of the junta, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Damiba, who will also serve as the country's president. The junta, which is officially known as the Patriotic Movement for Preservation and Restoration, it's also sacked Intelligence Chief, Senior Colonel Francois Uadraogo. However, the junta also restored the country's constitution that was suspended after it ousted President Rock Mark Kabore during the 23rd January coup. Now, there had been concerns about the health of Burkina Faso's ousted president and demands for his release from house arrest. Well, representatives of the Economic Community of West African States have met with ousted President Rock Mark Kabore. Now, prior to this meeting, there had been no information about the whereabouts or condition of the former leader. While the delegation did not reveal where the meeting took place, the head of the mission, Ghanaian Foreign Minister Shirley Ayoko Botchwe, said he is in good health. We can say that we've come to see President Kabori, and um, on the surface, I mean, we've had a good conversation with him, and um, he's in good health, and he was able to have a good conversation with us, and um, he, we will send that back to the heads of state. Burkina Faso is now a suspended member. ECOWAS will still continue to work with Burkina Faso. The fight, the security situation is a situation that affects the whole of West Africa and, some, and even beyond West Africa going towards Central Africa. And so we will not leave Burkina Faso on its own. We will continue to work with Burkina Faso to fight this menace of terrorism and um, armed conflict and so on and so forth. So um, we will work with um, the new administration. Joining us now is African Affairs Analyst Lester Wilcox for more on this, specifically the role the regional bloc ECOWAS is really playing in the region. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the program. Yeah, thank you, Laya, for having me. It's my great pleasure. Thank you. Well, in the last uh, one or two years, we've witnessed coups in Burkina Faso, Guinea, and Mali in the West African region, and it seems... The same scenario is playing out, you know, after the power grab, regional bodies impose sanctions and suspensions, but that does not seem to stem the occurrence. What do you think? Well, I had always said it before, and I'll keep saying it. Uh, regional blocks in Africa, especially ECOWAS and even the AU, have gradually become a toothless bulldog. And, uh, con and uh, constantly... They are drifting far and far into the oblivion because there have not been any serious, uh, a, a serious um, uh, a reaction to this misadventure of um, military back, uh, 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 having incursion back into civil authority. Like you said, and it is becoming predominant in, in West Africa. We're now having the first one within a space of two years. Out of 16 country blocks, four have is now under the jackboot of uh, military junta. So you have just 12 left. And uh, what is the guarantee that those 12 within the next six months, uh, there will not be? So ECOWAS has become toothless. And uh, I'm so disappointed at 
the statement of the Ghanaian foreign minister. Yeah, I, I, I've never seen the height of a height of uh, uh, unseriousness. On one hand, you are uh, Burkina Faso is suspended. On the other hand, you still be working with Burkina Faso. I can't. I don't understand such uh, misdirected statements and such uh, speaking from two sides of the mouth. And that is the problem uh, West Africa is having today. There is no concerted effort. There is no strong reaction. There is no strong definitive uh, 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 measure that will forestall any junta from incursion. Apart from what happened in Gambia, which was not really a military incursion, but like a civilian to civilian transition. And then Nigeria, Ghana, uh, and some other countries put their foot down, even threatening with military invasion before uh, uh, the uh, Yajami linguished power. Now, in this case, we have, we have seen we have a clear case a uh, constitutional breach of removing uh, elected uh, uh, administration by force, which was the dark days of the 80s and the 90s. Now we are going back to it. And ECOWAS can only say suspension, sanction, and at what hand you are still working with them. I don't get it. And I think so, uh, it's, it's a big joke, I would say. Apart from these sanctions and suspensions now, what more needs to be done by ECOWAS and you know other regional blocs because before these countries descended into the military takeover, there have been protests from the citizens, you know, Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. We've had citizens on the streets expressing their dissatisfaction, you know, to the government. What more, you know, can be done? Well, the truth of the matter is uh, the principle of non-interference in state, in state matters need to be reviewed. Uh, yeah, it's an international principle for which uh, ECOWAS and other regional blocs have adopted. But when it is becoming clearly obvious that the internal internal revolt is creating more problem and, uh, 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 and 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 it's leading every day to military incursion, then uh, ECOWAS leaders need to begin to look again how they they apply that the, that um, that principle of non-interference to other state matters. Um, at the level of uh, peer review, I think that there's a mechanism called peer review mechanism within the ECOWAS uh, treaty. Uh, that needs to be uh, to be strengthened, because yes, uh, will agree with me that the civilians, the citizens, are never satisfied. That is human nature. Even 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 in civilized world, they are never satisfied. Today, the 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 the, the, the rating of uh, President Biden is as low as less than I, I mean in the 30 percent level. That shows how unsatisfied these human beings are. A uh, British Prime Minister is facing serious uh, pressure from his own people at home. So there's always that need, but when there is review and ECOWAS leaders are telling themselves basic truth about how good governance can be implemented in their various countries and how internal strife should be checked, how the security situation should be addressed, I think this will help. But when it gets to the point of uh, uh, a forceful takeover of power by the military, there must be a strong statement. Yes, it might not be only be ECOWAS. And sometimes, too, the problem ECOWAS is having, I understand the problem they're having. Sometimes all these incursions have the backing or signature of the Western countries, like it happened in Guinea and some other places. France and other countries may have interest in some of these things. So I understand their problem. But United will stand, the United will fall. If all the ECOWAS countries come together and in one voice, and if anybody breaches that protocol and it's having both economic and the political sanctions imposed on them. Now, what kind of sanctions do we give? The, 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 the protocol on free movement is still existing. So the, the, the citizens of those countries are still, who are, who are members, who are working with ECOWAS are still there. So what sanctions are you giving? I don't even understand the level of sanctions you are giving. And so this is not, the, 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 the consequences is not strong enough. And so oh, I fear, okay. sincerely, my fear is that we might get to Gambia, we might get to some other smaller states, Syria alone and, and the Liberia. These are smaller states that people can just take advantage of what's happening in other and then just go, go back to the dark days. And I think, my fear is becoming very, very right by the day because the, the deterrence is not much. And it's well, just we do, a mere word for word. And at the end of the day, we'll go back to, to, to square one. We do hope that is not the case. But thank you so much, uh, Alastair Wilcox, African Affairs Analyst. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. It's always my pleasure. Thank you. France says it is reviewing its military presence in Mali. That's after the expulsion of the French ambassador by the junta, which seized power last year. Paris and its European partners will be making a decision by mid-February on whether to withdraw some or all of the troops 
serving in a special forces unit called Operation Bakane, which fights Islamist militants. Mali asked the ambassador to leave following what it described as outrageous comments by the French foreign minister who describes the military leadership as illegitimate and out of control. Paris has already started scaling back its force of more than 5,000 troops who fight Islamists across the Sahel. Meanwhile, the EU is reacting to the expulsion of the French ambassador to Mali. The European Union Commission says the expulsion is unjustified and will lead to the country being further cut off from EU member states. Mali on Monday gave the French ambassador 72 hours to leave the country after what it termed as hostile and outrageous comments by former colonial power France about its transitional government. Back on Friday, French Foreign Minister jean V. Le Drian said Mali's junta was out of control amid escalating tensions between the West African state and its European partners. Well, in the Malian uh, government's request for the immediate uh, withdrawal of the French ambassador in Bamako is unjustified and will further alienate uh, Mali from its uh, European partners. The EU stands in solidarity with France and also with Denmark, uh, whose uh, contingent had been subject to a decision to uh, leave. The current situation requires uh, respect for commitment and dialogue on the part of the Malian authorities, and the negative spiral in which they have engaged can only be detrimental to the stability of the Mali itself, but also to the region. The Southern Africa Development Community Static Blocks Climate Services Center, CSC, is warning of heavy rainfall that could be triggered by an impending tropical storm called Batsirai. The CSC says Batsirai is evolving from the southwestern Indian Ocean and countries in the region that are likely to be affected are Malawi, Namibia, Tanzania, Angola, South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe. Well, the warning was issued just a few days after Tropical Storm Anna killed dozens of people and caused massive destruction in the region. According to the UN, the deadly storm shows the reality of the climate crisis in the world. Well, new regulations announced by the South African government is saying uh, the country will no longer require people who test positive for COVID and don't show symptoms to isolate. The country has already has also reduced to seven from ten the number of days required to isolate for those showing symptoms. However, for the first time since the pandemic began, schools will be reopening fully from Tuesday and the provision for a one meter social distancing has been removed. According to the presidency, the ministers of health and basic education expected to issue more directives in the coming days on the new approach. South Africa has recorded more than 3.6 million COVID infections and over 9,000 deaths, the highest rate in the continent. The World Health Organization says tens of thousands of tons of extra medical waste from the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has put tremendous strain on healthcare waste management systems around the world. Now, this is, this is now threatening human and environmental health and exposing a dire need to improve waste management practices. According to a new WHO report, there is extra waste being generated and it's three to four times the volume of waste that has been generated during the pandemic. The report is an analysis of healthcare waste in the context of COVID-19. And we really use COVID-19 as an opportunity to take a closer look at the volumes of healthcare waste that were being generated during the pandemic and what facilities, what countries, and what the global community was doing about it. So the main findings is there is extra waste being generated. It's three to four times the volume of waste is, has been generated during the pandemic. And in facilities that aren't segregating, that number goes up to 10 times. At the same time, we know that facilities are really struggling to address this waste issue. And before the pandemic, there was one in three facilities globally that didn't have the means to segregate and safely treat waste. And this number most likely has gone up. 
there's a lot of existing solutions and, and they're all based on the circular economy and thinking about how we can reduce waste in the first place. So the number one item is not to use PPE that's not needed. Gloves are not needed, for example, for vaccinations, and they're not needed for a lot of medical interactions, let alone by the public. So if we could reduce gloves in countries like the UK, we're already having a gloves off campaign before COVID-19, that would be fantastic. The message is we can no longer ignore the waste to issue. The good news is we can protect and prevent against COVID and we can protect the environment. So things like reducing use of non-essential PPE, things like reusing safe uh, products, especially for the public where they exist, like masks. And the third issue is to really invest more in waste systems and the waste workers to ensure that this issue is safely and sustainably addressed. Still to come on the program. Crafting delicate pieces of Amazigh jewelry, an activist is trying to sell the indigenous piece of jewelry in an attempt to preserve his cultural heritage. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Kenya has extradited two British nationals to the UK where they are wanted for murder. The Directorate of Criminal Investigation say the men were arrested last week in Nairobi's upmarket Kilimani area. Kenyan police said an international arrest warrant had been issued against them for the 2019 stabbing to death of a 16-year-old boy identified as Alex Smith in the London suburb of Camden. The UK's Metropolitan Police believe that one of the two arrested fugitives carried out the actual stabbing the other suspect is alleged to have been riding in one of two stolen cars involved in the incident. Two other men are already serving their sentences in the UK for their role in the murder. The U.S. Consulate General in Lagos has today launched its limited no-interview visa renewals to assist non-immigrant visa applicants in Nigeria who qualify to renew their visa. The additional visa policy, which differs from the previously known drop box that was stopped in 2019, includes uh, applies to certain categories of visas guided by certain criteria, such as visa expired within the last 24 months or will expire in the next three months from the date of application. Previous visa was a full validity, multiple entry visa, passport covering the entire period since receiving the previous visa, and the passport with the most recent visa. According to the U.S. Mission Country Consular Coordinator, Suzanne Tuller, there are about 10,000 visa appointments scheduled for the month of February in Lagos, which is pioneering the program. She advises applicants to visit www.ustraveldocs.com slash ng to check their eligibility and begin their application. Those who have already applied but have received dates running into 2023 would need to check their eligibility and cancel their previous application to be able to go through the renewal. After filling the form, applicants will need to present the required documents at their drop-off appointment time following which their passports will be returned by DHL with their visa if their application is approved or with a letter telling them the next steps to completing their application. Once you log in and you put in your visa fee, you'll have to answer a series of questions to make sure that you actually qualify for the program. And it's important you answer those truthfully because if somebody is not too sure and doesn't have the correct information, we will not be able to accept it, and then you'll have already used your visa fee for the program, and you may not be able to find another visa appointment right away. Um, after you do that, you'll print out a letter, which is what you'll take with you, and it tells you the date and time and everything you need to bring when you come to drop off your uh, application for a renewal without an interview. You'll come here on that date and time, and just like you would if you're coming for an interview, you'll join us outside in our visa pavilion and submit all your documents. But instead of having to come in for an interview, that will be it. We'll process your application. 
It's important to note that not everyone who applies, even if they meet the criteria, will receive their visa without an interview. Like I was mentioning before from the program that was suspended in 2019, there are people who will have to call in for an interview, even if they meet the criteria, because we'll have some questions about a prior travel history or maybe an arrest record in the United States or something else that we need to clarify. And they will have to come for an interview. Um, if you are qualified for the program and qualified for the visa, we'll send your visa and passport back to you to the DHL site that you selected as part of this initial process. If you are not qualified to renew without an interview, we need to see you. You receive your passport and a letter to that effect back, and then you can book a separate appointment to come in for that interview. We do have people who have booked as far out as 2023 or 2024 because we have so few appointments available. Those people, and it, there are instructions on this piece of the website, but I can say that those people are welcome to make sure they qualify first for this program. They'll then need to cancel the current appointment they have, and they can reuse that visa fee, their fee receipt number, to book one of these appointments. Now, if they meet the criteria and they're interested in doing that, I would urge them to do it very quickly, um, because like I said, this is a limited amount of appointments we have for this month. Although it's quite a large number, we have about 10,000 appointments available right now for people to participate in this program, and that's just for February. Rwanda is celebrating its national day at the UAE Dubai Expo 2020, and as part of the celebration, the government has organized a two-day business forum. Well, the ceremony includes guided tours of both the Rwanda and UAE pavilions, as well as meetings on investment and partnership opportunities in Rwanda. It will, among other things, showcase business opportunities in the country and also foster partnerships between local and international investors. Among the agencies that will feature include Rwanda Development Board, Rwanda Finance Limited, Rwanda Mining Board, and the Ministry of Health and Ministry of ICT and Innovation. Well, joining us now for more on this is Nutundi Muyelo. He is uh, the CIO at the Rwanda Finance Limited. That's one of the agencies featuring at the Business Forum. Hello, and thank you for joining us on the program. Hello, good day to you. Thank you. Now, what is the significance of this National Day at the Expo 2020 for Rwanda? Yes, thank you very much for this question. So, so first of all, um, it is important to recognize the, the importance of uh, the Dubai Expo. Um, as you know, with the current um, crisis that we have with COVID, um, this expo has been uh, difficult and challenges uh, to, to organize, and we appreciate uh, the effort made by uh, the leadership of UAE to organize it. Um, it is an important event. Um, you know, it's um, the expo with the largest number of countries. Uh, here we're talking about over 122 countries that participate uh, to that event in Dubai, and it was important for Rwanda. Uh, to be one of those countries. Um, just, for your, just for everyone to know, Rwanda only participated uh, to, three, um, to three expos. Uh, so the first one being in, uh, in Japan, the second one in Italy, um, and the third one now in, uh, in Dubai. So when we decide to participate to such, e to such an event, uh, you do easily understand uh, that we take it um, very seriously, and especially when it is around a special day, as today is the Hero Days in, in Rwanda. Um, so this expo is around the thematic of connecting minds and creating the future, uh, which is exactly in the DNA of Rwanda. And the agency that I represent, being Rwanda Finance, is actually in charge of one of the initiatives um, being the Kigali International Financial Center, who aims to connect uh, people from Africa with the rest of the world in terms of business and financial activities, but also to create the future of finance within the continent. So to, right, go, to, to go back to your question, All it right. was very important for us to be here in Dubai. 
All right, then. Uh, thank you so much. And Tundi Mugello, the CIO of Rwanda Finance Limited. Thank you. And as we end the program today, an Amazigh activist and owner of a jewelry store in uh, Ali Bentubula is trying to make and sell the jewelry in an attempt to preserve his cultural heritage. Let's take a look. Crafting delicate pieces of Amazi jewelry, Ali Ben Taluba's passion in life is to preserve the art that has been around for over a millennia. The Amazi activist, husband and father, makes bespoke pieces of jewelry in a style long overshadowed by more modern designs. With modes of ancient Berber carvings, the Tunisian jewelry maker spends hours in his workshop crafting Amazi jewelry from silver. I am trying to encourage people towards Amazic jewelry, even with facilitating payments, in order to encourage them to own and preserve this jewelry. When a woman comes to me, I educate her about the importance of owning this jewelry because it will remain in her name and live much longer than her and a hundred years after. They will remember the owner of a specific piece of jewelry. Despite the decline of the industry over the past years, silver remains popular among Amazi women in Tunisia. At home, his wife, dressed in traditional clothing, says the couple take their two daughters to Berber events whenever they can to raise awareness about their heritage and sometimes speak the language at home as well. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo. I did okay.